What key steps did you take to go from being a tenured professor, most people would do many things that probably aren't good to be in those shoes, to a movie producer? What I'm, I'm sure, first of all, you had to deal with social pressure, people probably trying to talk you out of it, maybe not. But what steps did you take? Um, well, in, in retrospect, you can always make it look more you know, planned and logical than, than it was at the time, but I basically, I ran into a, a very inspiring man whose name was Norman Cousins, who was the editor of Saturday Review World in those days. And uh, he came to speak in a class of mine at Occidental College. And it turned out we shared uh, a motto that no one else in the world had ever heard of. And the motto was a, was a single sentence by the philosopher, Spanish philosopher Ortega y Gasset that said, I think the only immoral thing is for a being not to use every instant of its existence with the utmost intensity. And uh, I had never heard anyone else quote that, but after, our, after his talk in my class, I asked him to come to my office and showed him that it was framed above my desk. And so needless to say, we bonded and long story short, I asked him you know, what I should do when I grow up, which I asked male authority figures all my life, basically. And he, he told me after we got to know each other that I should consider the entertainment business because it was much broader than the academic world and uh, people could basically do whatever, you know, it, anything creative you're encouraged to do, basically. And you could find your own way. Uh, there are no rules and schedules and all of those kinds of things that we find in academia. And I love academic, you know, the world and the, the ideas that are exchanged and all of that. But it was restricting, and it was, you know, for me, suffocating, which is a word that um, is, means a lot to me personally. It's my mo most ancient nightmare is being suffocated. And I've never been suffocated in, you know, in the entertainment world. I've been terrified a lot, but not suffocated. And uh, so he encouraged me, and I thought, well, I don't know anything about the entertainment world other than movies that I've seen, that's it. And he showed me a passage from a book by William Goldman that I hope everyone knows called Adventures in the Screen Trade. And the passage was uh, that the only important rule in Hollywood is that nobody knows anything. And I thought, well, that's, that's good. It means it's a level playing field. So I set out to learn as much as I could. And I realized that I wasn't 18 years old in the mail room at William Morris. And I wasn't, you know, infinitely wealthy. And I didn't have relatives in the film business. Those are like the three main ways to get into the business normally. So I thought I, I just have to be smarter. So I started writing, uh, reading contracts. I remember a producer, uh, he'll never forget, I asked him if I could read a distribution contract. And he said, yeah, I can let you read it, but I can't let you take it out of my office. You can go out in the other room and have a cappuccino and but you know do that so i read it and I, I came back an hour later and i said uh, i'm confused about some things i read here can i ask you a couple of questions and he said sure and he i said this paragraph number 48 in the fine print section at the end says that accounting terms used in this agreement shall be redefined by the 20th century fox accounting department at such time if any that litigation is entered into among the parties. And I said, what does that mean? And he said, that is not in there. I go, yes, it is. Let me show you. I showed it to him. And he said, I can't believe that that's still in there. My, my attorney should have crossed that out. He had just signed the agreement. And I said, well, they didn't. So I, I started learning. That's how I started learning by reading contracts, because I think whatever kind of thing you're trying to do uh, if it's successful, ends up with being a bunch of contracts. So you might as well start backwards with the contracts. And long story short, while I was preparing myself that way over a six month period, I, I came up with an idea that I sold basically on a wing and a prayer, not knowing how to do it. But it ended up being within the next 12 months, 16 movies uh, that I was completely in charge of and raised half the money from Warner Brothers and 
half the money from um, from a company in Canada, went up to Montreal and shot them all back to back, meaning one movie ended on Friday and the next one began on Monday. And uh, it was a series of romantic comedies. And it came out of my teaching romantic literature and also teaching publishing because a, a publisher was talking in, one of, in my publishing class, a visiting publisher was talking to my class and he was telling me, he was telling us what goes on the cover of a romance novel. And I realized as he listed the things that were on the cover that he was basically reciting the rules of courtly love that I was teaching in another class that were written in the 12th century by Andreas Capellanus, the, the chaplain of, of Marie de France. And, uh, and I thought, so maybe romance novels that everyone makes fun of are just an extension of these ancient courtly stories, these love stories. And uh, I, I came up with the idea of doing a series of movies that imitated these love stories and were marketing uh, friendly because they all had colors. So you could have put all the DVDs on the, you know, on the shelf and they would form a, a rainbow. So they were all called things like The Rose Cafe, Sunset Court, Indigo Autumn, etc. And we did 16 of them. And by that time I was, I was fully in the, in the business because I was in charge of production uh, as a creative production. And uh, within three movies, my assistant and I were, you know, we knew what we were doing, whereas we did not have any idea what we were doing before the first movie started shooting. And then I came back to Los Angeles and became a literary manager because I didn't have resources to option properties. But as a literary manager, you can produce properties by managing the property. And that's what uh, got me going and uh, ever since then. So it was, that was how the transition occurred and it was just because I thought of an idea and I didn't know better. If I'd known now what, you know, what, if I'd known then what I know now, I would never have sold it the way I sold it. I, I simply went out with the concept and convinced several studios to look at it seriously and none of them had looked at a script or anything like that and one of them Warner Brothers wanted to see a script and I wouldn't show it to them uh, until they'd signed an agreement and they ended up signing an agreement in three days and then I showed them, I, I manufactured the scripts over the weekend by putting out a call to the romance novel community and getting back, you know, ideas for the script and so on. So it, it was a fluke and one of the hardest things about being in the business when you've been in it for a while is the there grows up this huge accumulation of experience that you have that makes you know that you shouldn't just pick up the phone and call the head of a studio. And, and I have to overcome that. I just reached out to the head of a studio this morning. But every time I do it, it's like having a 500 pound weight in your hand to pick up the phone because you know that's wrong. But somebody like me back then, I didn't know it was wrong. so I. You know, it was light. It was a light motion to pick up the phone and call, call somebody. And uh, so, w whenever I get a new partner who's not involved, I always say, "Don't be afraid to tell me your craziest ideas because this is a world in which crazy ideas work." And uh, you know, it's it's the traditional ideas that have a harder time working. So, it, it is a completely wild and entrepreneurial frontier. Uh, it's probably the last frontier of American culture, the, the movie business, and uh, it's been changing ever since I've been in it. It constantly changes from a world in which video cassettes dominated and you could find them everywhere and to a world in which we're downstreaming from Netflix and Hulu and so on. And the, the delivery methods have always changed. And what doesn't change, and this is the encouraging thing for writers, is that the need for stories has only gotten greater and greater with the proliferation of hundreds of channels. They all have one thing in common, they need programming, they need content. And uh, writers are the ones who create the content, the intellectual property. So they should be hugely encouraged. You don't have to understand all the distribution methods, you just need to know how to tell a story and, and you're in good shape. Just keep telling stories.